Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Good to see you in Sunday school today. Clock on the wall says time to get going. I'm ready to see what the Lord has got for us today. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. Thank you for being at Gospel Tabernacle. Looks like we may be a little bit short this morning, but sure, good to see you all here. Good to see uh, uh, our visitors with us today. So uh, let's give them a big hand for being here with us. Mr. Harold Isbell and his daughter, glad to see them today with us, and uh, let's make them welcome throughout the day. Thank you all for being here today. We've got a great day in store, and the Lord has blessed us greatly. We've just came out of youth camp, or the kids did, and uh, a lot of the old ones did too, of course, and uh, from everything I've heard, it's been the best camp they've ever had, and just great news from there. Uh, Two of our own got filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for that. Sister Amy's very thankful. One of them was Ben. So we're thankful for that. And the Lord is doing some great things. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. Excited about youth camp. Everybody come back in was just bubbling over. And uh, it has caused a few people to come back with voice problems. One of them is our pastor. Uh, we heard reports about his sermons throughout the week. And uh, is there, uh, we may be a little bit partial, but I don't think too much. But I heard that uh, his sermon was the best one up there. And uh, I believe that for sure. Uh, we've got the best there is. And I sure appreciate Brother Levi and all he's put into youth camp for our kids. And it was a very great success. And uh, if you'd like to see some videos and things that happened up there, it'd be pretty, be pretty fun for you to look at. Marcy's got several on her phone. And uh, they just had a great time. But that's in the past, and we're ready to move on. But I am thankful for things that happened at youth camp. If you've never been involved in youth camp up there, you don't know what you're in for. You don't know how tired a person can get when it's over with. Uh, it's just running wide open from the time you get there till the uh, time you get back for three or four days solid. And uh, But they're, they're back. And you know, we do have several that's sick. Uh, that got sick from, I don't know if it's from youth camp or at youth camp, maybe overdone it a little bit. Brother Tanner's out sick today, so let's remember him. And I know we've got several more that was mentioned. I've, I don't remember exactly who they all were, but there's several of them that went to youth camp that's dealing with some sickness and uh, some colds and some flu-like symptoms and all this kind of stuff. Uh, maybe just a lot of it, the weather too, and getting hot up there, who knows. But let's remember them in our prayers this morning. Let's all go ahead and stand. And let me make mention of a few of our requests. Sister Helen Sellers doing better. Keep praying for her. She's in uh, rehab right now. And uh, let's pray that she'll re be able to return back to us just very shortly. Brother Ricky Butler, good to see him today. Talked to him before church. Said he had a good two days, the last two days. And i um, glad to see him up feeling better. Fred Dillman, Kurt Thurman got cancer. Thomas Western got cancer. Miss Carolyn Lloyd, I've told you about her before. Continue to pray for her. Julie Morris, cancer. Let's remember this request. Brother and Sister Cutshaw, still out and need a tuck from the Lord. Uh, Sam Wallace, we requested prayer for him last week. He was in very bad shape, and uh, he passed away. And so let's remember the Sam Wallace family, uh, most of us probably don't know them, but some close friends to Brother Jamie Woodruff that comes to church with us, so let's remember them. And then Brother Chris and Sister Lacey had tragic thing uh, happen to them this past week, this Friday. Uh, two of the workers that, was, that works with Brother Chris uh, had an accident down on Mitchell Hill Road, and... Uh, Unfortunately, one of those gentlemen lost their lives in the accident. The other one is doing a lot better and expected to come home maybe today or tomorrow. But let's remember Brother Chris, Sister Lacey through this. Many of you will remember the gentleman that sat maybe on the second seat here, baptized several weeks ago uh, here in our own baptistry. And uh, he was his life was taken this past week through a tragic accident. I uh, don't have a lot of family that I know of, but uh, let's let's pray. Let's pray for this situation. Brother Chris will have a tough situation. He's all of a sudden uh, got jobs piled up and no employees. Uh, of course, the one that's uh, 
is recovering. We'll be out for a while. And, uh, of course, just dealing with all this uh, that happens to your business is, is just a lot of stress, a lot of stress. So let's remember Brother Chris, Sister Lacey, and our prayers this morning. God knows how to work and take care of our needs through this situation. Anyone else have a request you'd like to mention? Yes, sir. All right, pray for him to this morning. Who else? Anyone else? I don't see Sister Doris here today. I'm not sure if she's sick or anything, but let's remember her and her prayers. She's been asking for prayer each Sunday morning. Anyone else have a request? Don't look like we have any more this morning. Brother Rogers, we, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Take us to the Lord in prayer. Pray for our service throughout this day today. All right, you may be seated. Come on, ushers, and take our offering up this morning. We've got something to give in the Sunday school offering. The Lord has blessed us that we're still here this morning and not one that has been called out into eternity is a blessing. Uh, us being able to be here, not sick this morning, that's a blessing. The Lord's blessings are great. The benefits of living for the Lord are wonderful, aren't they? Give if you have to give this morning. Brother Chad, Brother Joe is taking up our Sunday school offering. Most of you know I spent, a couple of weeks ago, I spent a week out in Colorado and uh, enjoyed it, the weather more than anything out there. Uh, it was a business trip, partial business trip. We had three meetings during the week, but... Uh, came across something that really stood out to me and when it uh when I heard it I said I'm going to teach that in Sunday school my next time I teach Sunday school that's what an impact it made on me and uh, I'm going to try to talk to us this morning and uh first let's start out reading this morning Isaiah 43 and 13 I usually don't read till over in the lesson but I felt this morning to read this right off the start Isaiah 43 and 13 and you can read along with us on the board or in your Bible. And it starts out and says, uh, Yea, before the day was, I am he. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who will let it, or who shall let it? Verse 14 says, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. This didn't make sense when I read this, whose cry is in the ships. So I had to figure out what, try to figure out what this was talking about. Chaldea was a port side city. Uh, it was just like our Biloxi, Mississippi. It's set right on the edge of the sea of the Euphrates and the Tigris River. So... Uh, when Isaiah was prophesying, he said, I'm going to bring down, or I brought down all the nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry was in their ship or whose faith was in their ships because that's what they depended on totally. And then it made a little more sense to me. It says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth the chariots or the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow. Verse 18 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. 
And I want us to pay close attention to verse 19. This will be our key verse. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Now, verse 19, I want us to read again in verse 21. Verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And verse 21 says, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. So let me tell you this morning, what we... What we have had in the past has been wonderful. It's been a great thing. And we've came from a long ways down to where we're at today. Uh, Gospel Tabernacle has experienced many highs and many victories through these past few years. We have come a long ways. Uh, these things that we saw in the past, I can tell you, was only a drop in the bucket to what we're getting ready to see. I don't, I don't believe it can even touch what we're being ready to see. It had to be done. The foundation had to be laid. The structure had to be built. Uh, and the structure of the church had to be done. The footings dug, the blocks put in place, the structure's here, and it was put up the right way. Our past was created the right way. I mean, we've come a long way, baby, if you remember that little saying, little advertising, we've come a long ways. But listen, we're getting ready to see things at Gospel Tabernacle that is going to astonish even those that have been here for a long time. It's going to be amazing what we're fixing to see at Gospel Tabernacle. I believe it's going to blow our mind. The groundwork has been done. The structure's here, and I believe it was done correctly. But Joel says this, Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. He has given us the former rain in moderation. It was enough. But it was in moderation. But your latter rain will be in abundance. That's the word from Joel. And I want to talk to us today about a subject that I've, uh, oh, well, I just came, come across it. Well, let me finish up with Joel. He says, your floors shall be full of wheat. Your vessels will overflow with oil. I will even restore the years that the canker worm sought to destroy you will eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your God who has dwelt wondrously with you. Now, people's going to be looking at Gospel Tabernacle in amazement. I'm telling you that. But let's don't have a prideful attitude, but I'm telling you, we need to start expanding our thinking. We need to raise our tent stakes just a little and stretch them out just a little bit because the Lord is fixing to do a new thing here. Something that we have never seen before. We're getting ready for it. Now, I want to talk to you about a subject that I come across when I was at a meeting in Colorado. My business partner one day, uh, one of those days was out there, said, I've got something I want to tell you. And uh, he said, I, I want us to build our fourth quarter on this in our company. And I said, tell me what you got. He's, he throwed a few things out there and I throwed a few things out there. And uh, this saying came out of that meeting. If the sky is the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? If the sky is the limit, why are there footprints on the moon? Now, that's going to take you a little while to comprehend this, but we've always heard this. The sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. That's you, we see the sky, but the moon's further away than the sky is, and there's footprints on the moon. Now, let me, let me tell you about a speech our president gave in 1962. Hi, was you, most of y'all here in 62? Some of you was not here in 62. Sister Stephan wasn't here in 62? Lord, I thought you was as old as I am at least. That disappoints me, Stephan. I'm older than I think I am. 62, how many was here in 1962? 
We've got several that was here in 1962. Do you remember who the president was in 1962? John F. Kennedy was our president at that time. He made a speech at Rice University on the college campus night September of 1962. I was born in August of 1962. I was a month old when he made this present when he made this speech. But he spoke to Rice College and he started his speech this way. He said, "We meet today with the knowledge that the future is a challenge filled with hope and fear. The vast quest of the unknown and the unanswered stretches far beyond our comprehension. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have truly come, but no man can realize how far we can really go. In a half century, we have advanced, advanced from caves to other shelters. Over several years, we learned to read, to write, and to communicate. The printing press came right shortly after this, and then a few months after the printing press, the steam engines and the electric lights. A lot has happened in this last half century. This is President Kennedy speaking. He said, airplanes have been invented, and now America has a new spacecraft that I believe can reach the moon. Some would have us stay where we are to rest and to wait. But I say America was not built by those who waited and rested, but men surged forward with new hope and determination and skill. We chased to move forward. William Bradford in 1630 said, All great and audible actions are created with great difficulties, but they must be overcome with courage. He continued his speech and said America was the leader in the Industrial Revolution. America was the leaders in nuclear power, and we will be the leaders in space exploration. We do not intend to mire in the backwash, but we intend to be first, the leaders from all the, for all the world to follow. Space expenditures will rise. Matter of fact, Space expenditures will triple over the last past eight years combined. We have given this a very high priority, and it will cost us more in the future. And even though I realize this is an act of faith and vision, for we do not now know what future awaits us, but I say, my fellow citizens, I say we will send a giant rocket ship to the moon. 240,000 miles away from its launch pad. It's more than 300 feet long, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of experiencing heat and stress more than it's ever been, working with precision, better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, and control, and food for survival. On an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to the Earth, re-entering the Earth atmosphere at speeds in excess of 25,000 miles per hour. It will cause heat about half the temperature of the sun, and we will do it right and we will do it first. America will be bold and willing to take the next step, the next step until we see it come to fruition. Let's do the job no matter the cost, no matter the effort, no matter the work. It will be done in this decade. Many years ago, a climber was asked, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? He said, because it's there. Mr. John Kennedy, ending his speech that day, was said, May God bless our most dangerous and rewarding effort that we have ever embarked on. This was in 1962. He brought something to Rice University that had never been done before. Can you imagine the shock that was on that crowd's face? With him standing up there and telling him, 
we're fixing to go to the moon. 240,000 miles away, and we're going to go there with a 300-foot rocket, and we're going to zoom through the atmosphere, step out on the moon. We're going to have to take enough survival food with us, and when we come back, we're going to come back into the atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour and land that rocket ship safely. Now, if he had told me that, of course, in 1962, it wasn't but a month old. But if, it, if you had been told this in 1962, you would have thought our president has dropped off of his, he, he's, he's off his rocker. And he said, we're fix, fixing to spend three times what we spend over the last eight years combined to get this done. And he said, it's never been done before. He said, I don't even know if it's going to work or not. This is a step of faith and of vision. We've never been there, and we've never done it before, but we will do it in this decade. That was in September of 1962. You can pull this speech up on YouTube if you'd like to listen to it. It's very good. It's called the Moon Speech in 1962. Uh, it's hard to believe that a year later, he was assassinated. One year later, 1963, he was assassinated. However, in 1969, the spaceship was launched. On July the 20th, Neil Armstrong stepped out of a spaceship on the moon and put footprints on the moon. And he said, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It happened just like President Kennedy said it was going to. Eight years after President Kennedy presented this vision and this plan, the man walked on the moon. So I'm going to ask you this morning, if the sky is the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? It's because somebody refused to stop where everybody else did. Somebody refused to go past where everybody else wanted to go to. He knew up front it was going to cost a little more. It was going to take a little more daring and a little more courage, but he was willing to go. You say, well, it was, it was not really any use of people going to the moon. I don't really see what the, what the big idea was of people going to the moon. Let me tell you things that were invented because somebody went to the moon. You know, they had to establish communication with that rocket ship 240,000 miles away and back. They had to establish guidance for a rocket ship going into outer space and, and entering back into the Earth's atmosphere. Floppy disks for computers were invented because somebody went to the moon. Cell phones were invented in 1973 because somebody went to the moon. UPC codes on merchandise to track prices invented in 1974. Push through soda can tops was invented in 1975 because they had to figure out some way to keep their food from spoiling when they went to the moon. And the change in the atmosphere, the change in the surrounding pressure, they had to figure out some way to do it. That's where our push top sodas came to be. And digital cameras were uh, invented in 1975. MRI machines, 1977. Emails, 1978. Sometimes I wish they wouldn't invent it. Sony Walkmans, 1979, was invented because they went to the moon. Artificial Heart was invented because they went to the moon. CD player, Apple devices, Microsoft, Nintendo, text messaging was invented because somebody went to the moon. What made this happen is because somebody said, we'll take the risk, we'll spend the money, we'll do the work, and we'll make the future better for other generations. It was curiosity. I'm sure it was curiosity that got, that, you know, that killed the cat. That's what they always say is curiosity killed the cat. But curiosity does a lot of things. It makes you explore things that you've never explored before. Consistency, creativity, and determination. When the world said there's no way, someone said, yes, there is, and let's make it happen. Now, let me bring this down to where we are at Gospel Tabernacle this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what I'm seeing at Gospel Tabernacle. 
I am very excited about it. And uh, sure, we have, we have battles to fight. We have devils to fight. We have spirits to overcome. You know this is the same old devil that the church has been fighting for 2,000 years? Same old one. He wraps it up in a different package and brings it to you, and you don't recognize it. But it's the same old devil we're fighting. Same things. Spirits, same old spirits you've been fighting for years. It's just manifesting in a different person or a different, different way. We've, uh, we've, we'll have our work cut out for us, but the Bible says there's no weapon formed against us that will prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. All power is given unto heaven, unto God, both in heaven and in earth. And Jesus said this to the disciples. Disciples marveled at Jesus when he was doing miracles. It had to be something amazing to see. You walking right along beside, you know, Jesus, the Son of God. And you know that, and he's doing miracle after miracle. And the disciples marveled at it. And Jesus said, don't marvel at that. These works I do, you're going to do greater works than these. This won't be a drop in the bucket to what you'll be doing. Then the Bible says this great verse, probably one of the most courageous verses in the Bible. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. How many knows God this morning? Every one of us just about has got our hand up. We all know God. This is most of us in here, I, th I believe, is saved and uh, have got the Holy Ghost and ready to go to heaven. But let's explain this or, or examine this little phrase right here. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Now, if I'm going to do something, I want to know what I'm going to be doing, don't you? If Brother Rogers walked up to me this morning and said, you've been doing some great exploits, I'd think, well, what have I done? Have I done something good or do I need to say thank you or I'm sorry I've done it? I don't even know what an exploit is. Or somebody, I've heard it preached all my life. I just I, I think it's something big because they always, preachers always told we was going to do exploits. So, And then they preached on how big that God was after us. So I assumed it was something real big that we was going to be doing, but I'd kind of like to know what it is if we're going to be doing it, wouldn't you? That's, it's talking about us, by the way, the people that know their God. It's talking about us. Exploits is a daring, notable, memorable, and heroic act or deed. Something done by someone that is out of the norm. An exciting or daring adventure. All of these are definitions of exploits. To make full use of an opportunity and exceed all expectations. Now, this is what the Bible says the people that know their God is going to be doing. It didn't say our preacher is going to be doing exploits because he knows his God. It didn't even say the evangelist was going to be doing it. it. didn't say our pastor was going to be doing exploits because he knows his God. It says the people. That's you and me. Just old common people. That's what we are. Like pinto beans and cornbread and onions, just us, us common folks are going to be doing exploits, heroic deeds. You and I, common folks doing uncommon and heroic acts that will live far beyond our years. Now, this is, as I told you, this is probably one of the most courageous verses in the Bible. The people of God will display strength and courage even when it's daring and bold. And God is looking for people that will go beyond the point that is required that are willing to sacrifice. Christian people that are not ordinary but will excel. That's what God is looking for. That's what Gospel Tabernacle is fixing to do. I believe I can show you that. Considering, Let's consider Abraham this morning. Father of faith, a man that was blessed with riches, uh, even called a friend of God. This was Abraham. Uh, the Jews all wanted to be called, well, we're the children of Abraham. They, they like to pin that on their back. We're, we're part of Abraham's descendants. Abraham was our father. 
and the Jews touted this all down through the biblical days. But let's look at Hebrews 11 and 8 this morning. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should go afterward, received for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Now, that was kind of dumb, wasn't it? How, how, how did man just strike off not knowing where he's going? Where you headed, Abraham? I don't know. Well, you're going toward, you're going toward the north? I don't know. You're going, going down toward Florida? I don't know. I'm just going. You're going. What about toward Memphis? You're going, well, I don't know. You're going toward Iuka? I don't know. You got to be know where you're going, Abraham. You're the father of faith. The Bible said he took out. And went and obeyed, not knowing where he went. Didn't have a clue where he's going. I'm just going. Just know I'm going somewhere. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. So not only did he not know where he was going, he was looking for a city that already had a foundation, but God was building the building. Now, if, if this had been in our day, folks, we'd have put him on the fifth floor of the hospital. He would needed evaluation or something. You said this man is dumb as dirt. He don't know where he's going, and he's looking for he's looking for a city. It's got a foundation, and God is going to build a structure of it. I, I just seems I just seems like he's off his rocker. He's lost his marbles this time. I always knew he was kind of goofy. Now he's gone. He's gone looking for something that don't even exist. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful. Who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky, in multitude, and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. You would think this is impossibility. But Abraham had a vision of a little boy running around his feet at a hundred years old. That's that's nearly an impossibility, but the Bible said that he he didn't snag, he didn't stagger at this whatsoever. He staggered not at the promises of God, but he believed that he was able to keep that which he had committed unto him. What seems impossible with man is just right for God. Now listen to me, God has been good to Gospel Tabernacle. He has been very good to Gospel Tabernacle. He's brought Gospel Tabernacle a long ways, and he has blessed us abundantly. And I'm telling you, these people that has looked at Gospel Tabernacle from the outside and said, I don't know how they do that. they just common folks there. I know most of the folks that go there. They don't have no millionaires and billionaires in that church. They just got common folks. I don't know how they're able to do what they're able to do. You know, I've heard that said from the outside several times. Y'all always seem to have the best preacher. Well, we do. I don't know how y'all do that. Y'all just y'all just a little handful of people on Glover Drive. This is what I want to get out of our heads. Gospel Tabernacle is fixing to walk into new territory that we have never walked into before. If the sky is the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? We've stopped before where others stopped. But I'm telling you, Gospel Tabernacle is fixing to go way beyond where we've ever been before. This is going to be new territory. You say, well, how do you know? Well, I believe the Lord has impressed this on me today. Uh, recently, as you, most of you know, we've just purchased 45 acres right here. Right here beside the church. And uh, probably over the t past 20 years, uh, we've no telling how many times we've talked about this spot of land right here. And uh, even, I guess, when, well, from right after Brother Hodum came as pastor, 
Brother Holden was a visionary pastor, and he's seen, he seen the future, a lot of things in the future. And uh, we inquired about it. Matter of fact, this little second part came uh, up for sale right here in this little house right here. As you know, Gospel Tabernacle bought it. We inquired about this. Uh, was it for sale? No, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. Not for sale. I don't know if we could even afford it at that time anyway, folks. I really don't. Uh, maybe we could have. Maybe we couldn't have swung it. I don't know if we could have or not. But Brother Levi, Brother Josh, when he was here, we inquired over and over. Is this for sale? No. We'll let you know it's tied up. Some sisters involved in it. It's not. We ain't able to get a hold of it. They're not ready to sell at this time. That was, that was, I don't know how many times that was done. Then, Brother Levi came, started pastoring. And just a few months after he started pastoring, he made mention of this little section of land out here. And he said, we'd like to have this section of land. He said, we'd like for it to become available. Pray about it. Y'all remember this, that y'all were here? Y'all remember this? So every time, I, I don't know what you've done, but every time I drove up and parked right over here in this particular spot, I would look over there and say, Lord, we'd like to have that land. You know our needs, you know our wants, and you know our desires. is not for anything uh, that we want to do ourselves, but we want to do something for you. We'd like to have this land. I'd drive down this road, turn around up there to circle, and come back, and I'd say, Lord, you heard Brother Levi, we'd like to have this land. We'd like to have this land here next to us. One day out of the blue, a man walks up to Nail. I think she was visiting out the Salvation Army. Uh, it might have been the Goodwill, and I don't remember which, but inquired about a shirt that she had on her T-shirt or top and said, where do you go to church? And she said, well, I go out Gospel Tabernacle. And he said, well, I'm dating a lady that uh, owns some land out there beside y'all. And Nail said, well, if it ever comes available, I, I might be adding a few words or not adding enough words. I'm not sure the exact conversation, but it was something on this line. If it ever comes available, we'd like to have a shot at it. We'd like to, at that time, we thought there was about 20 acres there. A few weeks later, a guy walks into the dry cleaners where Kendall owns the dry cleaners there. The same gentleman that talked to Nell didn't know that they were kin folks. Just started talking to him, and Kendall said, oh, yeah, I said, I'm a Frazier. My brother goes, you know, out, we go out to Gospel Tabernacle. And, uh, he said, well, I just met your aunt, and I told him I'm dating a lady that would like, they might want to sell that land. If you want to tell your pastor to get in touch with them, they'd like to talk to you about it. Long story short, a few weeks later, uh, this came to fruition, and we, Gospel Tabernacle, purchased the land. Matter of fact, Nail sent me a text last this past week and said, uh, we've just paid the first payment on this land out here, plus another 12000 on the principal. Can you believe that? That's in a two weeks' time from since we have purchased this land. I believe we owe the Lord a big hand for that. That may be chicken change to you. That's big money to me. But I said all that to say this, and I'm not trying to get the cart before the horse, but we bought this land, I think, at a good deal. They wound up being 45 acres in this land. I don't know of another church in town that's got the facilities we've got plus 45 acres. Not a Pentecostal church. I don't believe this was an accident that we've got this 45 acres out here that we're paying on right now. If the sky is the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? I believe in my heart that right out here will be the future of our sanctuary, our next sanctuary. And who says it can't be a thousand seat sanctuary? Who says we can't fill up a thousand seat sanctuary? Just because we have been gospel tabernacle not on a dead end trap. This 45 acres, the Lord has let, helped us to get this in our possession to do something with it. He. He already had it for his benefit. Trees was already growing on it. He, di he didn't give it to us so we could continue to grow trees on it. But I believe he has got a future for Gospel Tabernacle. And we're fixing to see some things happen. I think, I think I'm just 100% right on this, folks. 
we're fixing to see some things happen that's going to blow our mind at Gospel Tabernacle. I believe we will build a sanctuary out there that will seat maybe in excess of a thousand people. I believe this very facility we got right here will be turned probably into a school. We've got the cafeteria for it. We've got the gym for it. We've got the classrooms for it. We've got a sanctuary for it. We've got administrative offices for it. We've got spot for a Christian daycare right here. Uh, there's no telling what God is fixing to do. And I believe it's going to be done in such a way, in such a manner, that it will, that will astonish even us that has been here for a long time. I believe we're going to be astonished at it. Now, I don't know if you feel like that about, like I do. Maybe I'm getting the cart before the horse. But if the sky's the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? It's because somebody said, we're going to go where we have never went before. We're going to do something we have never done before. And we can do it. Common folks, we can do it. Now, Matthew 5, uh, four, uh, 5 and 14 said it like this. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, we get this mixed up sometimes. We, want, we say we want the Lord's good works, and we want to be glorified for it. That's right the opposite of what this verse says. We're going to have to do the works and then let God get the glory for it. It's the good works that we do, but we're going to glorify the Father which is in heaven. This truth was designed to take over the world, folks. When it happened in Acts, it was designed to take over the world. In a world of darkness, this is where Paul said, if I had only hope in this world, I would be of all men most miserable, but I have hope beyond this life. Don't be ignorant, brethren, concerning this. Folks, we're here. We're at Gospel Tabernacle. Let's give it our all. This is what I would like to ask us to do this morning. I'm going to skip some of this. I'm not going to have time to get finished with it all. I asked the Lord many years or several years ago. I said, Lord, you know I'm a giver. In my heart, I'm a giver. I want to help somebody. I've been able to help a lot of people. I realize that. We've got 90-something employees. That's 90-something families that I'm trying to help every day when I go to work. I thank the Lord that he's allowed me to do that. But I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I would like, to, I, you know my heart's a giver. I want to give people. But I said, I can't give more than I got. Or somebody's going to have to be giving to me. And that's not going to help the situation a whole lot. I'm going to be hungry instead of you. That's, only, that's the only difference. And the Lord impressed upon me and spoke with you. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you with riches, but all you are is the conduit. That's all you are. You're not somewhere where this is going to be stored up. You're just a pipe that's feeding it out to the next person. You're, you're going to give it on. It's not going to stop with you. I'm going to bless you, but you're going to take it and bless others. Our company last year uh, gave probably 150, maybe 200,000 to charities last year. We built a school in Israel uh, that would see the 150 little kids during this bombing uh, stuff they're going through on this Gaza Strip. We've been able to do a lot of things. But this is what I would like to ask us to do this morning. Expand our tent stakes just a little bit. Expand our thinking just a little bit. Don't be, don't be confused with this is good enough and this is all we'll ever have. This is good. It's just like Joel said, I gave the former rain in moderation, but your latter rain is going to be in abundance. We're in the latter part of this. We're, we're lucky to be here at this spot. We're just, I mean, we are. I'm, we're blessed to be here at this spot. But this is what I would like for us to do. I'd like for us to believe bigger than we have ever believed at Gospel Tabernacle. I would like for us to give more than we've ever gave at Gospel Tabernacle. It's going to be costly. 
Let's trust God more than we have ever trusted God at Gospel Tabernacle. Let's pray bigger things than we have ever prayed for at Gospel Tabernacle. Don't set limitations on God. You know the only limitations that God has is what we put on him. His power is unlimited. The only place you limit God is right here. What you think he can do. That's where you limit him. He can do anything. He, I believe he's going to bring people in in abundance over these next few years at Gospel Tabernacle. Our generation is dependent on us. Whether we expand our vision or not and go different places, this next generation is depending on us. If the sky is the limit, why are there footprints on the moon? Somebody took the risk and somebody said, I'll go and I'll be the first to do it. Let me finish up with Jonathan and his armor bearer. They were between a rock and a hard place. Really was between a rock and a hard place. The Bible says that there was a sharp stone on one side and a sharp stone on the other. The Philistines were down ahead of them, and Jonathan told his armor bearer, he said, who knows if the Lord will work for us. It's, there's no restraint to God to say by few or by many. It's not a big deal to God whether we're a few or many. Remember that. So Jonathan devised a plan. He said that we'll wave at the enemy. We'll discover ourselves to the enemy. We'll say, hey, we, here we are. We're right over here. He said, if the enemy says, are we coming to get you? He said, we're going we're gonna to go the other direction. But he says, if the enemy says, come on, we know that the Lord is working for our favor. So Jonathan and his armor bearer, two people, waved at the Philistines. Hey, here we are. You know what the Philistines said? Come on up, boys. We're fixing to show you a thing or two. Jonathan looked at his armor bearer, and he said, do you see all them people down there? The Lord is fixing to work in our favor. He's fixing to give us the victory. It don't matter to him that we're only two people. It don't matter if we're a few or, or many. The Lord has given victory in our hands. If you'll read that, they had a great victory that day. And this is what I'm telling you. Our journey may be a little dangerous, a little scary, a little expensive, a little labor bound, a little hard work, a little more trust than we used to, a little more faith than we've exercised in the past few years. But we're fixing to see some big things here. We're fixing to see some big things at Gospel Tabernacle. I want you to remember this. If the sky's the limit, why is there footprints on the moon? Because somebody went beyond the norm. they done a little more than the normal people are doing. And we're going to see some great things at Gospel Tabernacle, and I'm glad to be a part of them. I don't know about you. I shared part of my vision with you this morning. I hope you feel like the same as I do. We're going to fight battles. We're going to fight devils. We're going to fight obstacles, and we're going to meet people that say, it can't be done. Y'all out there on the dead-end street. The Lord didn't give y'all 45 acres to do nothing with, whether I'm here or not. That, that land is not made to sit idle. It's to build something for the Lord. And I believe Gospel Tabernacle can build. I believe it can be the first Pentecostal church in this area to seat 2,500 people and have it full. There's 38,000 people in our county. 38,000 people. I guarantee you half of them don't go to church. Well, how, how many is that? That's a lot of people. The Lord will give us victory. It don't matter if we're just a few out here. We're fixing to see something at Gospel Tabernacle. I believe it's going to be really big. Uh, I'm looking for it. I'm just looking for it. I'm just, I, I'm just, I'm just like Abraham. I, I'm just, I'm just about as dumb as Abraham was, if you want to call it dumb. I just believe we're going somewhere, and we're looking for a city that the foundation is already laid. Here's the foundation, and the builder and maker is God. Let's give the Lord a big hand this morning. I know I knocked your socks off with some of this stuff this morning I was telling to you. Probably shocked some of you. Hearts to hands is going to be canned ravioli, canned spaghetti, canned beefaroni. Put that on your menu when you go out to buy groceries this morning.